Uh, so when you're trying to understand history in the 20th and 21st centuries, a shorthand way of analyzing the years from 1900 all the way up until today, 2021, would be number one, private property. To what extent should individuals be able to buy land and own the production of that land, even if that ownership would result in, or could result in goals that are inimical to the rest of society. And then number two, how should debt and banking be utilized in growing an economy? So the super shorthand way of looking at this would be private property and debt. And you can't discuss private property without, without discussing rule of law. And so you understand, hopefully, that when you're studying Western capitalism in this time period, what you're really looking at is this idea that the system in place worked for the United States because it's such a vast, vast area. And it's also relative to that landmass underpopulated. And when you analyze it that way, you can see how private property would make sense, or at least more sense, in a country like the United States, rather than in a country, say, like China, with about two to three times the population of this country. So the primary issue with private property is the potential for balkanization, the potential for moneyed interests to act in ways that benefit themselves at the expense of long-term growth. And we've seen that in this country, in the United States, when we had a financial bubble in 2008 and 2009. So it's nothing new. We're also seeing it now because we talked about that relationship between private property and debt. We're seeing it now as well because in order to facilitate a recovery, we went from maintaining the private property system and rather than using taxes to bolster private property ownership, we decided to use essentially the banking sector through loans and therefore debt. And the consequences of that have been severe. Even though the United States continues to be sparsely populated, given the land that it has, the amount of land that it has, we're still looking at circumstances where you know, a home is in most, in many areas, unaffordable. And so what's, what that has done is create what we would call a rentier class, a French word. And ultimately, I, I would say perhaps going back to the battle between landlords, real estate owners, and renters or farmers, or people that leased the land from a an exclusive moneyed class. And so even now, now that we have even more debt than we did prior to the 2008-2009 financial crash, even now we're still in a position where because we've used debt and the banking sector in order to prop up the status quo, what has happened is we've priced out the ability in some cities to think long-term. And the other consequence of that has been of, of I should say, moving away from taxes in order, to, in order to fund government into debt and therefore private banking, which of course dovetails with private ownership. The other consequence has been that the banking sector, which is so vital to creating wealth on, an, on just on any level, has gotten to the point where it takes consumers for granted. And it's difficult to question that kind of judgment 
in this environment because if you are a consumer that pays off your credit card statements every month that you know maintains a small minimum balance for the most part you are costing a financial institution money you're a net negative and the idea has always been that you know banks are quasi governmental organizations they exist under either a state or a federal charter in almost every case they are backstopped by FDIC insurance. So if anything happens to your deposits, the government will step in and make you whole. So the idea has been that the banking sector, for the most part, is in a position, is in a paternalistic position. And it's allowed to make money because it's, it's in a position to help consumers and individuals and families gain access to things like, you know, food, uh, housing, education, and other essential items. But within a private property model that utilizes more debt than taxes, you can see that the long-term consequences would tilt the, politi the political structure in into the hands of essentially a banking elite. And to the extent that the banking elite is not diverse, to the extent that it's creating an economy that takes advantage of labor, but without the opportunity to generate a higher quality of life generation after generation, to the extent that's happening, you can see how there would be a backlash, what Malcolm X called, you know, revolutions that are focused on land. He pointed out that the Chinese Revolution was a land-based revolution. The French Revolution was a land-based revolution. It was essentially the renters taking by force and by violence the land that they had worked on, but not owned. Now, you can also see, we talked about private property ownership. We talked about the ability to own land on an individual basis. You can also see how if you're in a small place, the ability to own land on, a, on an individual, on a small basis, on a non-governmental basis, where you're allowed to more freedom to build whatever it is you like, would be inimical to long-term growth and sustainable population growth as well not just economic, but demographically. And so when you go to a place like Singapore that has managed to meld essentially a Chinese American model together, the best of both worlds, you'll see that private property ownership, whether it's cars or whether it's land or a house, you know, it's something that's priced out of, out of reach for everyone but the elites. But no one minds in Singapore because the prices are so astronomical to own a car and the regulations are so onerous. For example, you can't own a car that's more than 10 years old. So you put all those things together and what ends up happening is the elite are able to coexist side by side with a non-elite in a beneficial way because for the most part, the government is looking out for the majority of the population. And that's one of the reasons why you have a, <clears throat> a fairly decent public transportation system called the MRT. You have a housing system where people can't own the land, but they can own a, and transfer ownership of a lease, a lifetime lease <clears throat> within, well, a 99 year, 99 year lease within a condominium or apartment complex. And this would be called in Singapore an HDB flat. The ability of the government to own or to prevent individual ownership of land has meant, number one, that you don't end up in a position where real estate developers like Donald Trump create a political system that caters to them, whether it's in the form of tax breaks or something else.
you don't end up in a position where the majority of the citizenship of the population within Singapore is renting. You end up in a position where the government, for the most part, subsidizes housing ownership. I shouldn't say housing, condominium ownership. And as a result of that combination of public-private ownership, is able to attract the elite while not while while protecting its own citizens from you know the ravages of homelessness, of debt, and so on and so forth. And one of the ways it does that is by providing a, a mortgage interest rate that is extremely low, and quite frankly, only sustainable because of the investments of its sovereign wealth fund overseas. So when we talk about private ownership versus some other model of government ownership, what we're talking about is systems that depend on limits and systems that are workable in some countries but not others only because some countries have higher limits or higher thresholds regarding population growth and regarding just land, empty land, than other countries. So you can easily see that the American model of private property ownership just wouldn't work in a small country like Singapore, where you can drive across the whole country, assuming a straight line across the country, you can drive across it probably in a few hours. You can also see why in the United States, you have very poor public transportation because the private property ownership model that is protected by the rule of law has meant that on a local level, the city council is dominant, is basically controlled by real estate developers and police departments, which cater to essentially people that own property. And so, you can also see how that model would work to the extent that you have a stable banking system, to the extent that people are on the same page when it comes to this idea of the goal of working hard so that you can own something that can be passed along from generation to generation in a way that increases wealth continuously. You can also see how that model in the United States would be successful to the extent that taxation is the way that governments run themselves because then they have to answer not just to the banking sector or to people connected to the banking sector like real estate developers, but they would also have to answer to individual property owners. And so the idea behind private property ownership within a, a democratic system that disfavors government ownership of land has always been that the government would be more responsive to the individual, especially to the individual property owner, under the assumption that the individual property owner has a stake in the outcome of his or her society, and therefore can be trusted. His opinions or her opinions are valid, you know, a, a priori, or just fundamentally, without even doing any sort of other analysis. And you can also see how that kind of a private property ownership model would disfavor poor people, people that don't own property and who are in a position where they can easily be ignored unless they are somehow exceptional. In the United States, the exceptions would be you know, simply athletes. We spend a lot of money on athletes, people who are exceptional, and we spend a lot of that money because of the image that these athletes provide the United States, as well as, you know, the ability to gather data on health and fitness that could, could eventually be distributed to the whole population. So we look at all these different models and what you noticed in the non-Western model is not, a, not a, an antipathy towards debt, but suspicion of it, because rather than looking at the post-World War II economic order as communism versus capitalism, 
it might be better to look at it in terms of countries that lost the war. In fact, even if you won World War II, you were still in debt. So you can argue that post-World War II, you can look at, or well, you should be looking at history in the sense of dividing along the line countries that benefited from debt because they were able to put other countries in debt, even their own allies, and benefit from global trade in their own currency. And countries like China, who not only had you know, ports like Macau and Hong Kong taken away from them earlier by Western powers in order to facilitate global trade, you can look at them as countries that were colonized and to the extent they lost the war, you can also look, such as Germany, you can also look at a situation where those countries disfavored a model that was driven by the banking sector because they themselves were allocating a large portion of their labor overseas, quote unquote, to foreign interests. So you can also see how when you put all these things together, you can also see why xenophobia has been such a part of history over the last 250 years. Simply because if you lose a war and the model for recouping the victor's expenses and costs has been to exploit labor in other countries, not just through the taking of, of land, such as Hong Kong and Macau, but also just through it's the arbitraging labor in a way that benefits one party over the other. And the way to do, to do that, obviously, is currency. Because if you control global trade, your currency becomes more valuable by default. And, you know, of course, money, it depends on money flow. You're in a position where, to the extent that your money is being used and not somebody else's money or not some other country's money, you have a better say in dictating the terms and conditions of trade as well as any sort of legal structure that regulates that global trade. And in fact, a lot of the systems post-World War II were developed by American banking systems or, or American banks. One of them was J.P. Morgan. That's where the name comes from. I believe it was BIS, International Settlements, the IS in that equation. And so you can also see how the, the countries that are able to dictate those kinds of favorable terms have to be careful because to the extent that they are in a position where they don't, they mistreat the people in debt, you end up with a familiar pattern in history of both xenophobia and what Malcolm X talked about when he talked about all revolutions being based on land. And so rather than looking at all these different, you know, sort of economic battles based on, you know, just sort of labels that, don't, that no longer make sense, such as communism and socialism and capitalism, we're far better served if we look at them as Number one, private property ownership. Number two, how debt is used. Number three, the availability of land. Number four, the, I suppose, not just the availability of land, but just simply the population numbers. So of course, demographics and land go together and economic growth and population growth go together. <sighs> So if you look at it in that sense, you can you get an idea of just how complex any economic system can be. And a lot of people, I just read online uh, by a, a, an analysis by an engineer who was saying that these deficits that we have, these trade deficits that we have with other countries are intolerable because it means that the United States is essentially financing economic growth and population growth in other countries at our expense. In other words, if I'm in a neighborhood where it costs me a million dollars to own a home and somebody else in a foreign country is making less money per hour or per day and that person is able to buy a home 
at a much slower cost. What ends up happening in that system is that it makes it easier for the banking sector to go overseas rather than invest domestically, simply because you're arbitraging currency strength as well as the cost of labor. But what isn't discussed in that equation is that to the extent that, again, someone else is using your currency or that you do have a trade imbalance, the person that is imbalanced or, or disadvantaged is actually you know, in a difficult position because if the partner, the trading partner who is buying an excessive amount of goods or services from you goes away, your economy collapses. In other words, if I'm buying, if, I t if I'm trading with you, you know, if I'm buying a billion dollars, and dollars is the key word there, if I'm buying a billion dollars of goods and services from you every year, and you're only buying a hundred million dollars of goods and services from me every year. I'm the one that can dictate the terms and conditions and the loans and pretty much any legal or financial terms necessary to effect that trading relationship, especially if I have a superior Navy that can ship those goods overseas conveniently and under an insurance scheme that favors, again, that favors my terms and conditions. And if you are in a position where you are able to trade with me, but you're doing so because you're getting loans from either directly from me or from international organizations like the IMF or the World Bank that are using my currency. What ends up happening in those circumstances is that, again, despite the fact that on paper, you are quote unquote receiving a lot of funding from me, a stronger country with a stronger currency that has the ability to shape the terms and conditions of the insurance sector, what's happening in those circumstances is that the imbalance actually makes you dependent on me. Because at the end of the day, that imbalance favors a global trade based on my own currency. And to the extent that it's being done based on loans, as opposed to grants, which is how it's usually done, it puts the country that is trading with me in an even more difficult position because they can't distance themselves from my terms and conditions, at least not without declaring bankruptcy, which typically means, again, a kind of Cuban revolution or a Chinese revolution that drives out the moneyed class, which is, of course, connected to, in many cases, the quote-unquote white-collar classes rather than the blue-collar classes. And therein, you can understand where you have this quote-unquote class struggle. And what is odd about all of this is that no matter what system they use, it has to be a fair system. It has to be based on the rule of law that is administered in a way that's fair. And if it's not administered in a way that's fair, it doesn't matter what system you have. It doesn't matter what debt covenants you have. Because at some point, an unfair system invites violence. And sometimes that's done through the state, through the police officers, or through the military, or it's sometimes it's just done based on, you know, well, again, just an, a revolution. And that's where you have a clash between, again, the people that have benefited from these boom-bust cycles and the people that haven't benefited from these boom-bust cycles that have been so typical over the last 250 years. But you can also see because of the because globalization is inherently accepting of foreign elements, including, of course, foreign direct investment, you can also see how the, the potential for xenophobia is always there. And that's one of the reasons why Singapore has been so successful because it was able to look at Ceylon's collapse, it was able to look at Malaysia's racial riots, it was able to look at all these things and realize that 
that couldn't become a sustainable economic superpower unless it was able to mitigate sort of the animal spirits that are within us when it comes to racial relations. And so Singapore's founder, of course, has the famous statement that we are not a Chinese nation, we are not a Malay nation, we are not an Indian nation. This country exists for everybody. Everybody will have its place. We will set the example. And you can see how if you're going to set the example in a way that doesn't balkanize or segregate people based on ethnic or religious lines, you can see how that kind of a system would require more government regulation. And that's exactly what happened in the housing structure. The Singaporeans decided to use housing and government ownership of housing in a way that would promote a lack of segregation. And so what was happening in Singapore was essentially creating a quota system ethnically, which of course overlaps with religion, so that there would be no homogenous housing structures. Now, Singapore benefited from this because particularly because it's a small country. So you can't live in an area where you walk to the supermarket and you don't see people who look different from you. It's not possible because not only because of the structure of the housing and the quotas within those housing structures, but also simply because of the size of the country and, and the elements of public transportation, the busing, not just the MRT system, not just the train system, but the busing system. All of them meant that to the extent that you were exposed to hate speech, that it would be very easy for you to go up to somebody else and simply ask, Singaporean to Singaporean, is this true? You also would be in a position where if somebody was attempting to associate, you know, harmful traits to a particular religion or race, it would be much more difficult to be believed to the extent that you're able to see somebody from that ethnic group or from that religion on the bus every day or while walking to school or to your supermarket. And so the Singaporean model has worked. That's undeniable. The problem is that it's very difficult to replicate that model simply because it has taken the best of everything we just talked about. That Singapore has no net debt, demographics, geography, you know, it has a port and therefore is extremely valuable. Its only competition today uh, would be Taiwan or Chinese Taipei. Uh, you know, it's just in a prime position overall. And the question is, if you have been a formerly colonized country, what is your model going to be? Because one of the reasons that you were colonized is because the banking sector was not strong. It was not able to get the best elements from all over the world. It was not able to attract foreign direct investment because the idea was not to create a individual ownership of property. The idea was to create infrastructure, the hammer and the sickle, agriculture and infrastructure in, or, in a way that benefited the majority of people in society, especially citizens. And so if you're in that position where that model has been destroyed through foreign direct investment by force, by colonization, and what do you do if you now want to both uplift people who have been exploited in the past while not result, while not creating an exodus of the foreign workers that were brought in by the colonial powers? And Singapore's neighbor, Malaysia, has decided that its government structure will be based on uplifting essentially people that speak Malaysian, Malay, who are Malay and who, for the most part, you know, have been exploited by the British, you know, just by colonialists. And during the period where the British were in Malaysia, about 70% of the population was in poverty. 
So you can see how within that structure, any government that has thrown off the yoke of foreign direct investment through colonization would be interested in fixing that balance in a way that would mimic a quota system or an affirmative action system. And so you see how we're not again talking about models, we're talking about just a confluence of all these different factors. You know, when you combine demographics, debt, land, and, and private property ownership, when you combine that with history, you can see how you really have this accordion that tries to play music in a way that has to cater to everybody, but also has to put, sort of hit some notes harder than others in order to fix the past. But despite the fact that the average Malay, according to the former prime minister of Malaysia, Tun Mahathir, has said that the average Malay in Malaysia is better off than the average Malay in Singapore. And that's a fairly stunning statement, just given the, the, the fact that Singapore enjoys a trillion dollar wealth fund, something that only a few countries in the world enjoy or have access to. That's a fairly stunning statement. And, you know, I don't know if it's true, but it certainly would feel that to the extent the Malaysian population in Malaysia was able to dictate politically the terms and conditions of its existence, you can see how having less money or less wealth per capita, you can see how that would create a position where despite having less wealth, you would be in a position where you would, be, you would feel better off. So when you study history, we tend to think of history or analyze it through the lens of Europe, World War I and World War II. But we're much better off studying history through just two, those two countries, Malaysia, in Singapore. It's far easier to see within those two countries all the different effects of history in a way that allows us to learn from it and try to figure out a path forward. And if you're in Malaysia and you're trying to attract world-class talent, you know, you've, you've got to know that you can't rely on low wages perpetually. You know, even if you have low wages and a highly educated population, you know, what's going to happen is the extent that your neighbor is able to offer more money and a higher quality of life, what's going to happen is your neighbor is going to steal that talent. So if you're, whether you're Malaysian or Canadian, if you have a weak currency compared to your neighbor, what you're really doing is developing a lot of talent that will eventually be stolen. So we know that the model of good education plus lower wages relative to your neighbors isn't going to work. It's not gonna work because you're not going to be in a position where you're going to be able to attract a steady stream of talent. And in order to succeed, you have to attract talent from all over the world because talent is not distributed evenly. And it's particularly difficult to the extent that someone is stealing your talent, stealing your MDs, your engineers, and so on and so forth. So the real question for me is, now that you have these formerly colonized countries doing the best they can to resolve history or historical injustice, what do they do to be competitive when it comes to attracting talent? Because I don't think there's any doubt that a country like Malaysia or the Philippines would be able to attract pensioners, people that have a steady income uh, in a stronger currency that would be able to go and you know lease land for 25 years and use the, their stronger currency to enjoy a higher quality of life than what they would enjoy back home. But you can't build a society on this. You have to build a society based on the young and the young and the talented that have a stake in your society. And you're not gonna get there by attracting people who are 40 and up, even if they have more money than the general population. 
you have to get there by attracting people to your schools, to your universities, and then creating an environment where they want to stay. And in the United States, that battle for talent has taken place city against city, state against state. And, you know, one of the things that people talked about here is the creative class. People here were discussing, you know, what it takes to create or to attract creative types. And they were discussing all sorts of things, coffee shops, you know, just, um, you know, <laughs> public transportation being one of them, the biking paths, you know, just all sorts of things that would be attractive to the young. And <laughs> in some ways they got it wrong because, you know, what's happened over time is that the young have been, the educated young population here in the United States has been burdened so much with debt. They've just had to go to the big cities where they could, have, could gain a higher salary. So in some ways that battle for, of, of the colonial power, of the formerly colonial nations, or sorry, colonial subjects, that battle that they're facing now for talent is something similar to right here in the United States where the United States has not invested or has underinvested in less populated areas compared to higher populated areas. And so right now we're having, well, we're having not really a population boom at all, but we're having a demographic issue. The same thing is happening in Japan. And overall, you know, you have this idea that the investments that, are, that have been made based on debt have favored only a few cities worldwide. And so we know that because a lot of those cities overlap with ports, right? Think about all the cities that you know of, you know, uh, Kobe, Tokyo, Hong Kong, Macau, uh, Singapore. Just all of them really are going to have a port, LA, New York, New York Port Authority, Los Angeles Port, even Seattle is a port. So when you think about cities that have not done well, a lot of them have been quite far from a port. And that's actually happened just in the state of California where you had a gold boom that eventually busted. And you can see that when you go to quote unquote ghost towns. And when you go to these ghost towns, you'll see whether it's nearby the uh, Joshua Tree National Park here in California, what you'll see is that you had these boom towns that would sprung out of nowhere based on gold mining, but they couldn't sustain themselves. They're just as quickly as those structures, the housing, everything else went up, they came down because they weren't close enough to a port that would allow them to gain the trust of banking institutions and of course the elites that were running those banks. So even when you had something viable, you had a boom bust cycle within the United States because of the limited way that economic development has happened all over the world based on this post-World War II globalized trade structure. And when you look at it that way, you can also see that China's approach of, of relying more on land and trains, you can see why China has taken that approach. It hasn't decided to not to confront the United States head on or the United States naval based trade system head on. It's decided simply to use land and infrastructure to facilitate trade with its neighbors. And of course it has ports. It owns Hong Kong. Of course you have all these other places. Uh, and you're in a position where you are able to not only build out on land, but also gain the benefits of sea-based trade. So overall, when you study history, we too often think about it in terms of ideology. And it makes it really difficult because these labels don't mean anything anymore. If you look at it more in terms of how trade is done whether, and how governments maintain power, do, do they do it through taxes? Do they do it through this idea of trying to be directly involved in the essentials of life, like housing, 
like food and so on and so forth, or do they do it by delegating to private entities? And again, the risk of the latter Western form is that you end up in a society that, that, is, that tilts towards segregation without ever realizing that it's doing something wrong. And if you do that, if you follow that model in the, in the United States, which, has, has, which on top of that has a history of chattel slavery, you can see how you end up in a society that tilts also towards a police state. And in fact, on a local level, the majority of the funding goes to public safety on, on a city level. So you can see how the United States model is probably not the best model for anyone else, unless they have a lot of land and unless they're able to dictate the terms and conditions of trade in their own currency. And to the extent that that's not an exportable model, you can see how the United States is going to have a tough time competing with, say, a Chinese-based model or any other model that might be easier to export and defend overseas. And you can also see how this is going to create a lot of issues here in the United States because you're going to see a familiar pattern when people are not doing well here or anywhere else in world history, there's been this antipathy towards what we just talked about, foreign investment, foreign elements, because you know, people don't want to be in a position where their labor is exploited or disadvantaged. And when you hear all this rhetoric that's anti-China, you know, again, it's just a form of, of historical bias. Whenever you have a country that is not doing well, especially in a, in a diverse country where foreigners or people that don't look like the native-born class, when that happens, historically, right, there's been a backlash against foreign elements, which has then led to xenophobia. So a lot of what we see now, whether it's categorizing the coronavirus as a quote-unquote Chinese virus, whether it's just simply trying to kneecap China or just any other country that seems to be doing better than the United, than, than the United States in creating and maintaining a middle class for its own citizens. When you look at that structure, it's again, something that's easily understood to the extent that we understand history. It's just a repeat against foreign elements that, that spills over into xenophobia and a mistrust of an, of an economic system that's run by banks. And in some ways, that's a natural consequence of a country that delegates to the private sector, but without retaining the knowledge or the expertise in order to regulate the excesses of the private sector. And this again, just goes back to the idea that the United States has favored an, econ an economic structure that's based on a strong currency in order to maintain its ability to set the terms and conditions of global trade. And if it doesn't do that, you know, it's got a huge problem because those terms and conditions are enforced or at least dovetail with military investments and naval investments, <laughs> which of course dovetail again with the banking sector, with insurance companies and so on and so forth. And all these other agreements that advantage the the hours of work of an American citizen over a non-American citizen. So in other words, if you're trading with the Philippines, you're not only able to attract the best talent from the Philippines, but you're also, in the, in the event of a crisis, you're also able to use international banking structures to, quote unquote, help these countries by giving them loans in your own currency. So because of, because of the coronavirus, the Philippines has had to import or has had to take out more loans to buy vaccines. Those loans have been administered by what is called an Asian Development Bank, but it's not really an Asian Development Bank, it's a Japanese Development Bank. Uh, every head of that banking syndicate has been Japanese. And of course, the Japanese are post-World War II, or have a huge interest in maintaining a system that prioritizes the use of the American dollar.
when you put all these things together, it's kind of curious why we're focusing in the United States on racial discrimination, when the real discrimination that we should be focusing on, given the wealth gaps that we have, is wage, global wage discrimination. And in other words, why should an hour of my time be worth more than an hour of someone else's time in a foreign country simply because of what happened in 1945? And if you look at it that way, you can also see that why a lot of the countries that have accepted American investments are not doing well. Well, the Philippines, of course, is not doing well. It's not independent at all. It's Again, it's had to import vaccines. It's had to go in debt to import those vaccines. That's just one example. What's really happened is that, you know, the Philippines has been a victim of, of an American-based economic model that, again, probably isn't something that you can export. And the goal of the Americans, especially when you have a government that's run by loans and banks that are associated with real estate developers or specific real estate developers, what ends up happening is you end up copying whatever blueprint works for you in your nation and you just sort of end up taking that blueprint and putting it somewhere else. And in the case of the Philippines, it just hasn't worked. You know, the roads are mismanaged. You have, because of colonization, you also have, you know, a lot of different split governments. So in other words, you have provinces or barangays that you know, essentially run their own policy. And so you end up in a situation where, you know, you're not really coordinated in any way. And as a result, you know, something like a highway transportation system, you know, national highway system isn't really feasible, especially if a lot of your money is coming from tourism, you probably don't want to develop some, some areas. You go back and you look at all these other problems in all these other countries, and a lot of those problems derive from trying to do a copy and paste of what's worked in the United States and in, in the UK, and then trying to, to just transfer that into an Asian country. And it hasn't worked at all. And it's just made a lot of these countries that didn't have an advantage like a port. It's just made those countries dependent on a foreign country. In other words, it's, it's furthened and deepened colonization rather than made it, created a world where you really do have a United Nations that's based on independent, independently functioning governments that are able to work together to create, avoid war and to create you know, goals that are aligned. And so if you look at it in the sense that a lot of smaller countries post-World War II never really became independent, look at it that way, suddenly the United Nations makes a lot of sense, makes a lot more sense, because the United Nations has, to some extent, been a failure. It hasn't really prioritized diplomacy at all, and that's why we continue to have war. But if you look at it in the sense that, you know, this is a natural state of a world where countries post-World War II never really became independent because they were tied to a foreign banking system and a foreign currency, in a way that denigrated their labor. You can see how the United Nations would probably be set up to fail, or at least be run by moneyed interests that dictated the terms and conditions of trade. And also see how this wasn't necessarily a bad model to begin with, because to the extent that you had, you, know, you can simply see how some countries have done so much better, but all of them have, for the most part, had a port so Taiwan, Chinese Taipei, it's successful because again, without Taipei or Taiwan, you know, Singapore becomes a monopoly in that area. And so the United States has an, has an interest in maintaining the, uh, an alliance that favors itself through trade with South Korea, Singapore, and Taiwan. But to the extent that the United States overinvests in these three countries, What's happening is that it's leaving out a lot of other countries like Vietnam, Cambodia, essentially everyone else. And so you can see how you have this balkanization, not just domestically based on access to ports and banking funding, but you can also see how you have a global structure that balkanizes the whole world based on these dynamics post-World War II.
And again, how do you how do you emerge from all this if you're a country like Malaysia? And I think that's the question that you have to look at because you know obviously China didn't get to where it is overnight. And so the Chinese model was that you would attract a lot of this foreign direct investment, but you would learn from it in a way that would allow you over time to build your own structures and create a model of capitalism that would benefit everybody long term. And the way that the, that the United States has tried to limit the ability of other countries to learn from its methods and practices and so on would be to export an older model of business um, and you know, maintain a newer model for itself. So you can see that now with oil. The United States is now oil independent. It's one of the largest oil exporters in the whole world. You can see how it's moving towards a quote-unquote green economy while at the same time having an interest in maintaining these other subject colonies, financial, financially subject colonies, you can see how the United States would be in a position where it would benefit from having these allies overseas still on the old model. In other words, it would be using its oil revenues to fund essentially another way or a better way of doing business while maintaining you know, a lot of these former allies in a disadvantaged situation. You can also see how that, that structure has allowed an opening for a competitor like China, like Russia to step in and offer a different way. So that still doesn't resolve, again, the question of talent, the question of how do you attract best talent from all over the world? And that's something that countries really have to think about. And, you know, a lot of people will say rule of law. A lot of people will say, you know, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of people will say all kinds of things, right? People, like I said, will say coffee shops and creative classes and so on. Art, you know, public art and so on and so forth. But I think the way to do it would be simply to have an honest government. That's one way to do it. A corruption-free government. That's what Singapore is, by the way. It's a corruption-free government. Its wealth stems from that position. It's not a coincidence. And so if you are Malaysia, you know, the, the fact that you've resolved or at least are on your way to resolving the 1MDB scandal is a good sign. But if you want to attract people, talent, you have to have a corruption-free government that works with the banking sector in a way that ensures a fair structure, not just financially, but overall. So you don't want to have too many loans. You don't want to have too few loans. That goes back into why the banking sector is so important. And in the United States, because the, government's, the government now runs governments, right, local, state, and federal, they essentially run on, on loans. The ability of the United States to regulate the banking sector in this country is diminished. So at least with other countries, they have a, an, an ability to have a fresh start. They can try to do a better job regulating their banking structure, but all that has to go back to creating a corruption-free government, an honest government. And to do that, you have to have an honest police force. So I think that if you're Malaysia, you're actually in a better position than you think. Because of course, it was a police chief, a Sikh, Officer Singh, that exposed the 1MDB scandal, that just broke it apart. And that creates a foundation to move forward. It creates this opportunity for Malaysia to move away from low-cost labor and try to move up into a society that has sustainable growth. And the question is, if you're able to have an honest government, if you're able to regulate your banking structures and your banking sector in a way that makes sense, which Malaysia, of course, <laughs> has had experience with because of the Asian crisis that happened, I believe, in 1998, which, of course, spread all over Asia, all the way to Thailand and so on. So you have all these different structures, these experiences that allow countries to do a better job. And the question is, I guess, how do you create an honest government? And that, that is where Singapore comes in. And that's where people probably do want to look at the Singaporean model.
where they do pay the politicians a lot of money and where they do make an effort to attract the best and brightest into government service. And so if you are trying to study Singapore today as a formerly colonized country, you have to understand Singapore was also colonized. It was colonized by the British and then the Japanese. And it rose from that. And if we're going to move away from a port-based success model, then Singapore's example is still instructive. You have to specialize in something, in this case shipbuilding, that allows you the ability to dictate the terms and conditions, at least on some level of trade, that makes a situation of mutual dependency, not just a one-way dependency, like in the Philippines. And if you do it that way, then you can not only maintain your own talent, right? Because the government is, is attracting the best and brightest. It's actively seeking out the best and brightest. It's able to do so because of its reputation for honesty and being corruption free. If you do it that way, you're able to keep your talent. You're able to create a strong police force. You're able to have physical safety. You keep doing that all over. And from that foundation, the colon formerly colonized powers can try to create a model that works for them.